Welcome to the Words Up Early Level 1 Speech and Language Key Messages for Language Learning and Interaction Training. For this training, you will need copies of the Words Up Early and Words Up Primary Key Messages from the Highland Literacy blog or the Bumps to Bairns website. You will need a wrapped sweetie or wrapped piece of fruit. And you will need a pen or a pencil and some paper. We're all here to hear about the key messages for language um, using the Words Up key messages. And it's really important that we all hear the same key messages because they're used Highland wide and they're used for early years settings, um, including the primary one settings through nursery and the private settings as well. They're used for parents, family, teams, um, and they're also part of the oral language strand for emerging literacy. So it's really important that everybody hears the same key messages and we're all using the same key messages for parents um, and children so that everybody is using the same um, and that's a consistent key messages used across the Highland. We know that there are many factors that can impact on speech and language and communication skills. So we know there are things like genetic factors, uh, things like when children have Down syndrome and there are neurodevelopmental factors um, such as autism and developmental coordination disorder and speech and language disorders. And all of those things impact on speech and language development. There are environmental factors, so when children have um, a difficult upbringing in the first few years. Uh, all those things impact on speech and language difficulty before they come through the doors into nursery and, and primary one. Um, but what we know from research is that the biggest positive impact on developing speech and language um, skills and communication skills is adult-child interaction and for us that means that the biggest positive impact is what we actually do with the children when they're with us um, what we know is that you know if a child has a hearing difficulty what we can do is aid that hearing difficulty if they've got a visual difficulty we can give them glasses but actually if children have speech and language and, for, for speech and language and communication what we know to improve speech and language communication is its adult-child interaction. And we can think about that in two ways. We can think about that and thinking, oh no, that means that there, you know, it's our, you know, it's us that has that, that emphasis on us and we've got to do that, that skill and we've got to improve that skill for children. You know, it's a heavy emphasis on us. Or we can look at that in a positive light and think, actually, that's a real skill for us. What we do has a real positive impact on children. Um, so all those people that say to us, you know, all you do is sit around all day and play with children, what we say is, no, we're having a positive impact on children's speech and language and communication skills, because we know that what we do makes a real difference to children's speech and language and communication, and making a real difference on speech and language and communication has an impact on their health and well-being, and on their future mental health, their future outcomes, in terms not just of education, but like I said, their mental health, and their achievements in the future as well. So it's, it's a really positive impact that you can have. Some people might have just heard of Words Up, and um, we're now talking about Words Up Early, which this, this training is, came from um, the before words, which is used in Highland and Murray, and now in Highland we're calling it Words Up Baby. So it's a developmental journey which goes all the way from pregnancy all the way through to the end of primary now. So we'll have, we have Words Up Baby, and then we have Words Up Early, uh, and Words Up Primary. Words Up Baby covers the pregnancy stage right the way through to about um, a year old. So we have two kind of poster stages for that. We have the pregnancy stage, um, so the before birth, and then we have the baby stage, which is um, the first year of life. And that's thinking about the development of communication pre-birth through to the first year of life and the importance of talking to your bump and then talking to your baby in that first year. And as I said, that came from the um, before words originally. And it was uh, looked at the importance of giving key messages to people in a very simple form, using cartoons and very simple key messages. And that's been researched and shown that it was really effective. Um, people remembered the key messages. They reported that they talked to their bump and their baby more. Um, and that they remembered that format, that it was that the format that it was given in, they remembered that. Um, and we took that format and developed the words up early from that. We've then got words up early, um, which goes from about 12 months all the way through to the end of primary one. 
It looks quite busy at this stage because we've got four sets of two posters. Um, the reason it's busy is because there's a lot of language development at this stage. If we think about children go from kind of not using any words through to say, saying quite long sentences at the end of primary one. Um, so we've got the first word stage, words together, talking together and chatting now. Um, we kind of tend to think of the chatting now poster, that pale blue poster being the primary one stage. The talking together stage, kind of the end of nursery stage. And what we've got with these posters is the top posters are the stage of development and then the poster underneath is what you should do at that, at that stage, the kind of key messages of how to support children in their development. So although there's four posters with four key messages at each stage, there's actually only six key messages in total because some things are repeated all the way through as being really important at each stage. Um, so these, these posters take us from, as I said, from the first words all the way through to the end of primary one. You will need copies of the Words app early key message posters for this task. Think about a child from your setting or classroom. Looking at the different Words app early stage posters, have a think about that child around about what you see in terms of their speech, language and communication. Which of the four stages is the child at in terms of their speech, language and communication development? Are they at the first word stage, the words together stage, the talking together stage, or the chatting now stage? Please pause the video when completing this task. We've then got a Words Up Primary, so this is just one poster. This is four key messages that take us through from Primary 2 all the way through to Primary 7. So there's four key messages here, and for those of you that know a little bit about uh, Words Up already, you'll see that there's a couple of key messages that are repeated from the Words Up early stage. So we've got Be Careful with Questions which some people can find a little wee bit tricky as a key message, but it's still in there, so we still have to keep practising it. And we've got give thinking time, which is similar to our pause and wait at the words up early stage. And then a couple of other things come in. We've got a repeat and revisit, and we've got using gesture meaningfully. So in summary, our six key messages at the words up early stage of the ones that we look at in this training are play and talk together, quiet time to talk, being face to face, pause and wait, be careful with questions and copy and add. When you're looking at these you're probably thinking some of them seem quite simple and quite easy to do and you'll be probably doing some of them already in your practice. Um, you will be doing some of them, absolutely you'll be doing some of them. Um, but what we want to do is think about some of these in the trainings in the, in this training package and think about how we why we're doing them what's important about these key messages for communication and the impact they have on children's language and communication and also how we can tweak them and make them really important for language and communication in our practice for this task you will need a piece of wrapped fruit for example an orange or a tangerine or a wrapped sweetie, and a pen and piece of paper. What you need to do now is to take a sweet, um, and I want you to pretend that you've never had a sweet before. It's probably hard to imagine that. Um, and as you take the sweet and unwrap it and eat it, what I want you to do is just jot down on a piece of paper all the words that you think of as you eat the sweet to describe that experience. So all the way from unwrapping the sweet through to eating it. So it could start with how the wrapper feels and also how the sweet feels in your mouth and how it tastes and all of those words to describe that experience. And just jot those down on the piece of paper as you eat the sweet. Please pause the video when completing this task. You probably have quite a long list of words now. It's interesting how one small experience can develop such a lot of words. What I want you to do is have a look at all of those words and pick one of those words and we're going to have a think about how we learnt that word. 
So we have a think about how vocabulary is learnt. You might have picked a word similar to yummy. Some people come up with that word. Um, and we're going to think about how we learnt that word. So maybe have a reflection and think about who taught you the, who taught you the word that you've picked. So if we're thinking about the word yummy, who maybe taught you that word? Was it a parent? Was it your mum or your dad? Was it an older sibling? Was it an adult in your life that taught you that word? Okay, so maybe it was maybe your dad who taught you that word. So you're thinking about how did you learn that word? What was happening? How did he teach you that word? So when I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about the word yummy, I'm thinking maybe my dad taught me that word when I was eating something when I was a child and he was feeding me something and he was watching my reaction and he was seeing that I liked that and he was telling me that's yummy. So when we one day he was teaching me that and he was feeding me something and he saw that and he said that. Think about when you've learnt that then, you've had that experience with your adult alongside you telling you. That's really key. So what we know is you need an adult and the experience together to learn a word. And that's our play and talk together. But if we did that one day, I'm wondering if the next day, would you know the word? Maybe we'd need to learn it a bit more. And that's the third thing that we need. We need an adult, we need the experience, but we also need repetition. And those three things are the things we need to learn vocabulary. And repetition is really key. So repetition, we know that children who are learning language typically need to hear a word in a context where they understand it, so that's about the experience, 50 times on average before they'll truly understand that word and be able to use it. Now that has real implications for vocabulary learning in the classroom or in the nursery setting because we need to think about how we plan for vocabulary learning if we need to get that 50 times in. So if we're thinking about in classroom learning or in the nursery setting, how do we get that 50 times in of new vocabulary? If we're doing a topic in the classroom, say we're doing, I don't know, dinosaurs, how many dinosaur vocabulary words are we going to fit in? If we pick five words of five new dinosaur names, if we're going to get them in 50 times, that's an awful lot of vocabulary learning, an awful lot of repetition to fit in. If we're picking an example for maybe the nursery and we're thinking we're going to do some baking and we're thinking about maybe we've got children who've never done baking at home and maybe we're thinking about the word flour or we're thinking about the word whisk or we're thinking about um, maybe the word butter because they're going to do some mixing. How many times are we going to get those words in? If we only do baking once and they have the flour to mix, we can't use the word 50 times. But we could think about extending the experiences across the nursery setting. We could put flour in the sand tray or we could make Play-Doh. Both of those involve flour. But because we use the word, we have the key message play and talk together, what we need to do is have an adult alongside at those times. So we would need to have an adult at the sand tray when the flower's there. So we can say to the child when they're experiencing that play with the flower at the sand tray, that they're pouring flour, that they're mixing the flour, that they're throwing the flour out of the sand tray, all of those things, so that they get to hear that word all of those times and they get that repetition. You will need a pen or pencil and a piece of paper for the following task. Okay, so we've had a think about playing and talking together and thinking about how we're going to add the right language to experiences to give the children vocabulary at the right time. What we're going to do is have a think about conversations that we have. So I want you to take a little bit of time and jot down some things on a piece of paper that's finished this sentence. So the sentence is, I really hate it when I'm talking to somebody and they. Think about some conversations that maybe don't work for you and some of the things about why they don't work for you. Please pause the video when completing this task. So have a look at the, some of the things that you've come up with. You might have come up with some things like when somebody is um, looking at their mobile phone when you're trying to talk to them 
or they're not really listening to you and why they're not listening to you or maybe they're a little bit unresponsive. Some of those are some of the things that annoy me when I'm talking to people. Um, and have a look about, uh, have a look at your list and have a think about what it is that they've put and now have a think about how that makes you feel. When we look at how it makes us feel when conversations go wrong, we usually have two kind of feelings and people feel, feel different things. And it's okay to feel this way. Um, and it's okay to go into both of these camps and you might be in one camp one of the time and in one camp most of the time or across the two. So really we see people who either feel that do you know that real down kind of I feel fed up I feel like it's not worth communicating I'm just going to give up those people aren't listening to me so I'm not going to try or we feel that real like I'm really angry and I'm really cross and will you just listen to me and I'm going to really try hard and I'm really frustrated and those two kind of feelings are common when communication goes wrong and we feel that as adults when communication goes wrong and I'm pretty sure everybody will have had something on their list um, about what they hated when communication goes wrong um, and it would have provoked feelings of things that in, in them either that they didn't want to communicate or that they felt really cross and angry about it and frustrated. I think that we see that in the children that we work with so we see either that children give up and don't want to communicate and don't try or we see that children get very frustrated and angry when communication goes wrong. And I think we see that quite a lot with children. And we see that in children that don't necessarily have communication difficulties, but just children that are learning to communicate. And the reason for that is that what, what's important in communication, and if you look back at your list of the things you've written down, what you'll see is what's really important for communication is that there's a balance. We're not looking for someone to just sit and listen. It's not really important that we're able to just have a monologue of communication and the other person is sitting listening. What's really important is that there's a balance. So that it's important that I get to say what I want to say, the other person listens, but also that they respond. And they respond in a way that shows that they're listening, so they take a full turn. So it's really important that everybody has a balance of turns, that we all have our say, in a, in a conversation. When we look at communication with children, it's really hard to get that balance right because we're talking about communicating with young children whose communication is just developing. And we are adults who've been communicating for a long time and we have better communication skills. So when we think about our um, Words Up key messages, all they're trying to do is tweak our communication to bring it in line with children's communication and try and create a balance so that children get to have their say, get to have their turn and keep it in a balance. So some of our things that we we have as our key messages are things about being face to face, um, pausing and waiting. Some of those things will be on your list of things that you've said. So some of you might have said, I really hate it when I'm talking to somebody and they don't make eye contact. That's our face-to-face -face key message. Some of you will have said, I really hate it when I'm talking to somebody and they either talk over me or finish my sentences. That will be things like what we say around pausing and waiting. Because when we pause and wait, that means that somebody can have their turn and they can finish their sentence. So some of our key messages will come out of the things that you've already said that you don't like that other people do when we're having conversations. Okay, so we've looked at the play and talk together and we've thought about um, being there to add language to the experiences that the children are having. One of our key messages is quiet time to talk. It's really important that children have some quiet time to talk in the day so that they're able to hear their language. And children need to hear language in order to learn language. Um, they need to be able to hear the sounds and the syllables and the pattern of language as well. This can be really tricky in a nursery and classroom environment because one of the biggest things that's noisy is the other children and sometimes the adults talking to each other too. Um, you'll see on the, on the picture that we've got a, a TV and a phone crossed out. That's also for parents as well and it's not such a big issue in nurseries and classrooms. Um, 
but really all we're thinking about at this stage for quiet time to talk is just asking you to spend maybe five or ten minutes thinking about what are the background noises that are going on when we're asking children to listen. So particularly at the times when we're asking them to listen, so when it's story time, circle time, those key times when we're asking them to listen as a group, what are what's going on in the background? Are there dishwashers on? Are there washing machines going on? Are there is there tidying up going on or preparation for other activities? Or are there even adults having that chat in the background? You know, what's going on at those at those times when we're asking them to listen? Are there things that can be changed to stop that disruption going on? Um, because I'm pretty sure if you know, when, if you were listening to something, and something was going on, you know, if, if somebody was preparing a snack behind you when you were trying to listen, you would probably turn around to look. Because I know I would. I would want to know what was going on. Um, so it's just having a little think about that. Please pause the video when completing this task. Okay, so we're thinking about we playing and talking together. We're with the children. We're creating some quiet times to talk and we're adding language when we're playing with the children alongside their experiences. So we're going to have a little think about being face to face. I'm sure some people will have had um, people not making eye contact as part of the thing when they thought about what they didn't like about communication and um, when it went wrong. Um, so this is a two person activity. It's quite hard to do face to face without two people. So if you're in twos and um, thinking about we're just going to have a little activity. What we want you to do is one person stay sitting, the other person stand up in front of them and just have a little bit of a conversation. Please pause the video when completing this task. Okay, so once you've done that, if you just, the person who's standing up, if you go behind the chair of the person who's sitting down and just have a little bit more of a conversation, carry on your chat with the person standing behind the person sitting down. Please pause the video when completing this task. Have a think about and discuss with your partner how each of those two tasks felt. Please pause the video when completing this task. Right, so we'll just have a little chat about how that went. So the first situation, you were standing up in front of the person sitting down. Um, a lot of people tell me that that feels a little bit intimidating, um, particularly if you don't know the person that was standing in front of you. Sometimes it's okay if you do. Um, but that's a little bit to show you, uh, a little bit extreme and a little bit contrived, but to show you a little bit what it's like when somebody is towering over you. Um, I'm sure most of us think about getting in a face-to-face -face position with the children that we work with because we're really conscious of the fact that they're much lower down than us just because they're shorter. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows actually being in a face-to-face -face position can really help at times, um, particularly in things like when we're doing behaviour management strategies with children. Um, but certainly it's worth thinking about key times that we might not be in a face-to-face -face position. So certainly those times when we're thinking about behaviour management or we're thinking about starting a conversation with children, we might start talking before we actually get to them. So if children are playing on the floor, we'll start talking as we come to them. But we could change that by trying to crouch down and join them in their play before we start talking, and then we'll make sure we're in a face-to-face -face position. Or going across the room to them, and if they're doing something, getting across the room to them and getting the face-to-face -face position before starting to talk to them. Um, and actually when they're coming in in the door in the morning, that thing when we're starting to say hello to them and greet them, often we're in a much higher, higher position and not face-to-face. -face. Could we crouch down and greet them in the morning? It's thinking about, do we know what's happened to them in the morning already? Have they had a rough morning? We don't know that. Some children will have had quite a tricky morning before they've even come in the door. So actually getting down and being face to face and saying hello is quite a good way to greet them. If we think about the activity where you went behind, how did that feel? Was it tricky to carry on the conversation? Did you feel like you didn't know whether the person was actually talking to you or not? Was it hard to hear? Did you feel like you missed quite a lot of the conversation? So if we think about times where you've been on the phone to somebody and maybe texted your friend and or had a text from a friend. I'm sure lots of people have had a text from a friend and thought, is that friend actually really annoyed with me if I really upset my friend? Um, and then when you actually spoken to them, realised that you got the wrong end of the message. 
because you've missed a lot of information through that text. You've missed facial expression, body language, and actually you've got the wrong message because you haven't had that body language, you haven't had that facial expression. We miss a lot when we don't have that. And if somebody's behind you, you don't have that information, and it's the same kind of thing. And it's really tricky to hear, it's really tricky to know if they're speaking to us. And we think we would never speak to somebody from behind, but actually quite often if we have children at a tabletop activity, it can be really difficult to get in a face-to-face -face position and we can come from behind. So if we're thinking tabletop activities and snack, a really good trick to try and get face-to-face -face is to leave a space at the table and to come into that space so that we can see all the children and be in a face-to-face -face position. Okay, so we're going to come alongside the children um, and we're going to think about getting in a face-to-face -face position before we talk to them and we're thinking about the la adding language to the experience. So what do we do then? What we need to do then is we're going to pause and wait and we're going to pause and wait to see what it is that they're doing so we can add the right language to their experience um, and that way we get the, the, the language right and we're going to give them the right vocabulary um, and we're just going to see what it is that they're doing um, and what we say is we say pause and wait for 10 seconds. Now, 10 seconds can seem quite a long time, so 10 seconds would be from now. To now. I'm aware that that feels quite a long time. And I'm aware that some people will say, what about the children that jump in? What about the children that respond quicker than that? Obviously, if a child does respond, you respond back to them. But that 10 second pause is about giving children enough time to process language, giving children enough time to process what they're going to do next. And it's thinking, it's called a pause and wait, because it's not just a pause, it's thinking about what you are waiting for. It's like an expectant wait. And it's about knowing the children in your setting and in your classroom really well and thinking about what is it that I'm waiting for. Um, it might not be language. We might not be waiting for them to use a whole sentence. Um, there will be some children where you are literally just waiting for them to, to take a look, look up, engage with you in that way. It might be that you're waiting for them to put the next brick on the tower. That might be their turn. But it might be that you're waiting for them to say a long sentence. It's about knowing your child and knowing what their turn is going to be knowing that the children in your group and it will be different for different children so that pause and wait is about really observing your children getting to know them getting to know what you're waiting for and building those pauses and waits in and it's a really key strategy for knowing what, what what's going to be the next step for them what's going to be that their turn in the conversation and building in that balance of turns once we've paused and waited we can see what they're going to do. We can then add a comment in about what they're doing and then build, build in the next pause and wait. It's a continual thing around pause and waiting. We've set up us joining the interaction. We've thought about joining in their play, being alongside them, thinking about being face to face and pausing and waiting and having a quiet time to talk at some points of the day. What we're thinking about now in the next two key messages is about the language that we use and how we add the language that we use. And these can be quite tricky key messages to think about. So the first one we've got is be careful with questions. Um, and this is really going to think about the, the, the language that we use and the questions that we use. Um, and this is really rethinking what you might have been told in the past. So you might have been told about using open-ended questions to extend language, but this is really going to think about it in a different way. So on this slide, I've got quite a few questions that I've put up, but I want us to reflect back to the activity we did with the suite and when we learn about how we learn language and vocabulary. So if we think about how we learn language, let's think about we've got... Um, the three things that were really important. So the three things that were really important for learning language were to have an adult alongside the experience with lots of repetition. And that's how we learn all language across the board. So that's numeracy language, 
question words, um, emotional vocabulary, that's all language that we think about. Okay, so now we're going to think about using questions. So if I pick one of these questions, if I think about what colour is it, if I'm a, a child sitting with a, a red pen, and if I think about whether, if I don't know the colour of that pen, and somebody asks me what colour is it, I'm never going to be able to tell you the colour of that pen by being asked the question if I haven't already known it. What you need to do at that point is tell me the colour of that pen. You need to tell me it's a red pen. But you also need to tell me I've got red shoes, I've got a red jacket, it's a red table, it's a red chair, because I need that 50 times repetition in the experience, as I experience it from an adult, all of that repetition, because that's how I learn the language. Okay, if I know that it's a red pen, you might want to ask me what colour it is, if you want to check out that I know it. Once you've already asked me the once, what colour is it, what you need to think about is how many times do you want to ask me that? If I already know that and I've told you that, you need to think, do, I need, do you need to ask me that again? Or is there something else you can tell me? Is there some other language you can add to that? So if I already know that it's a red pen, maybe you could tell me that it's a light red. Maybe you could tell me that it's a dark red. Maybe you could extend my language in another way rather than test that out again. Okay, so that's one of the things with the language, if we, with the question. If we take another type of question and we think about the questions here about why did you do that or how did you use it? If I take those questions, those why and how questions, and we'll look at development of questions in a, little, in a slide later on, questions are do develop in a certain way. They're, they're, they're a concept. They're a developmental concept. And why and how questions are really quite tricky. Um, so... How many, if you have a think about how many of the children you've asked in your setting, why questions? So why did you do that? Why did you hit, why did you hit um, somebody? Why did you, um, why did you hit James? And um, they'll say, I did, I did hit James. And you might be feeling quite um, emotional at this point. You might be feeling quite annoyed that, that James hit wee Johnny. And you'll say to James, why did you hit Johnny? And he'll say, I hit Johnny. And so you're not getting anywhere. You're feeling quite annoyed that you didn't get anywhere. But actually, the reason they're not answering the question is because they're not developmentally ready to answer the why question. They're not developmentally ready to answer the how question because they're quite tricky questions. And actually, most nursery children will not be ready to answer why and how questions. And actually, often the children in P1 are still not ready to answer the why and how questions. And they're quite tricky to answer. So those kind of questions are still quite tricky. So we need to think about, when we're thinking about questions, we need to think about whether children are developmentally ready for those questions. We also need to think about why are we asking those questions? Are we asking because we really want to know the answer? Are we asking because we're testing out what they need to know? And we need to think about that. The other thing is, sometimes when we ask a question, it can make us feel a little bit under pressure. So have a think about when you're at a course, how many people when they're at a course and somebody asks a question are the sort of person who's desperately trying to avoid eye contact because they don't want to be asked that question because they're dreading being asked a question. And how many people when they're at a course and there's that lovely question at the beginning about what do you want to learn from this course? What do you want to take from this course? You'll see that questions on this slide. They really hate that question because you don't know what you want to learn from the course because that's a really tricky question to ask and it feels really pressured. And how many people, when they go for an interview, the thing that they really dread is, I'm going to be asked a question that I don't know the answer to. There's something about being asked a question that makes us feel a little bit pressured and under pressure and it's exactly the same for children. Being asked a question can make us feel under pressure because there's a testing nature of questions, there's something about a question that's a right or wrong answer. So we need to remember that. Questions have their place. 
And that's why our message is be careful with questions. Absolutely, we need to use questions. But there needs to be a balance. And they don't always work to support children with communication. Just to have a few minutes to kind of reflect to yourself. How, how often do I use a question in my setting to a child, but they don't respond? And then what I do is, I follow that up with another question, even though I know that perhaps they're not going to respond again. I think we all do that. Partly the reason we do that is because in our heads we have a little toolbox of how do I start a conversation. With adults, we pretty much do that 100% of the time with a question. So if you think about how you went into the staff room today, or how you came into your nursery today, or how you, the last time you met up with a group of friends, you would have started the conversation with a question. So you might have said, how are you? You might have said, how was your weekend? How was your night out? How's your husband, if you know he's not been well? How was your dog? All of those questions. Those are the type of questions that we start a conversation with. And pretty much 100% of the time, that works with an adult. So we have this learnt pattern of start a conversation with a question, it works 100% of the time. So the reason we go back to that is because it works. And that's the majority of our conversations are with adults and they work. So that's our learnt pattern. So the reason we use that when we work, talk to children, even though we know that when we ask a question of a child and they don't answer, it hasn't worked, we still go back to that learnt pattern. And it's just a case of change is tricky and learning to change that is tricky. But we do have some strategies that we can look at to support. So when we're thinking about our be careful with questions key message, what we need to remember is that questions can kind of stop a conversation and they can put a child under pressure. So when we say about stopping a conversation, sometimes when we ask a question, what we mean is we won't always get the right information back that a child wants to tell us. They can test, and sometimes we need to test a child, but we need to think about how often do we need to test that information. So remembering about if we already know the child knows the colour, or if we already know the child knows that information, how often do we need to ask that? So our two things to think about instead uh, one of them is we can balance our questions with a comment and the other one is the last key message we can copy and add. When we're thinking about using comments what we need to think about is using a range of comments. So this is one thing that you can have a go at and we can have a go at this now. What we do is use this handy tool so we take our hand and draw around it on a piece of paper what you do then is write a question in the middle, a typical question that you might use all the time for children, and then we practice changing it into comments and the different types of comments that you can use. So you can use an exclamation, a label or a name, describe what a child is doing or has done, describe it from your own perspective, and then use a ponder comment, which is like an I wonder. So an example might be, what did you have for lunch? And you change it into an exclamation would be, oh, wow, look. Or, so a wow or a look would be, look, there's salmon nibbles. A label or a name would be to label or name something that you can see. So you could say, I can see you've got a fork or I can see, your, I can see you've got a sandwich. A describe from what the child is doing or has done might be describing what they've done at lunchtime or something that they've had for lunch. So you could describe something they've done at the playground. So you could say, I saw you climbing up the climbing frame. Describing from your own perspective is just saying something that you've done or you are going to do. So you might say, I had a cheese sandwich for lunch. And the ponder, the I wonder is, I wonder what you had for lunch or I wonder what you did at lunchtime. All of those comments you always follow with a pause and wait. So you have a turn now. Choose a question that you put in the middle of your hand and see if you can change it into those comments. For this task, you will need a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper. Draw around your hand. In the palm of your hand, write a question 
which you might use in day-to-day -day conversation with the children. For example, what did you have for lunch? In each of the fingers, instead of asking the question, you're going to write a comment that you could make. Please pause the video when completing this task. I said earlier that the questions develop as a developmental concept, so this slide is just showing how they develop. So at the bottom of the question steps, we've got using comments, um, which underpins the development of questions. And then we've got the steps going up as the questions develop and as they get harder for children. So the very bottom step after questions is choices. So that's the first type of question that children develop their understanding of. So by choices, what I would mean is where children develop the understanding of a choice where we would say, for example, do you want milk or water? Do you want an orange or an apple? So that's the first type of choice that children develop. Initially, they would always go for the last thing, so they wouldn't necessarily have that choice. So you really need to check they've got that understanding first, if you think they're understanding that. Check by swapping things over or by holding the two items out to them and making sure that they really understand that choice. So once children understand choice, they then start to understand that kind of yes-no question. So do you want to go outside? Do you want to have an apple? Those kind of questions where you get a yes or no response. And then we then move into what, you know the WH type questions. So the what, the where, the who, the when. And then, like I was saying earlier, what we've got at the top of the question steps is the why and the how. And the why and the how are at the top, and they're the most tricky types of questions for children to understand, and they're the latest ones to develop, because they, do, they, they do involve some kind of reasoning. So children have to have some kind of reasoning, they have to think about things from others' perspective, they have to kind of think about how to reason and work out things. And like we were saying before, they develop at the end, and therefore... Therefore, there are some children who are still in primary one would still not understand those type of questions. So those kind of things about why did something happen? How did that happen? How is somebody feeling? Those kind of questions will be still difficult for children in, P in, in P1 for some of those children. We've got it as a kind of question steps. And this is, can be used as a tool to help you. So if you were climbing up steep steps and it got too tricky what you would do is you would turn around and come back down the steps. And that's the same for these question steps. So if you ask a question to a child, what you would do is, say you said, who's in the story? You would ask who's in the story. You would, of course, have your 10-second pause and wait afterwards, of course. And then you would think in your reflection, OK, this child's not answered. So you would reflect to yourself, OK, I've asked the question, they've not responded. Is it because they don't know the answer or is it because I've asked too tricky a question? What can I do? So I'm going to come back down the steps because, I've, because they've not understood the who question. So you would come right back down to the bottom and you would either give them the answer using a comment or you would make it a choice question. So if you said who's in the story, they don't respond, you've done your 10 second pause, you would either give a comment and say, it's a rabbit, there's a rabbit in the story, or you would offer them a choice and say, is it a rabbit or a dog? And that can work for anything. So how did you come to nursery today? You've done your 10 second pause, there's no response. You can either say you walked to nursery, or you could say, did you walk or did you come in the car? So our last key message is copy and add, and again this is about how we use our language to support children's language. Copy and add is a great strategy, it can be used for children at any developmental stage, and it helps us to keep our language at the child's language. So we match our language to the child's language, and it helps us to model what the next step is for children. So it's a really simple strategy. What we actually do is we repeat what the child says or does and we add a word. And the thing to remember is what we do is we clearly name any non-specific vocabulary they do. So by non-specific vocabulary, we mean things like it, that, or there. So if a child uses those words like it, that, there, 
what you do is change it and put the proper word in. Um, if children use things that are unclear or are not quite the correct grammar, again, you reflect it back in the correct way. Right, we've got a, a little activity to do, thinking about copy and add. So remember that the rule is you reflect back what the child says or does and you add a word or a little bit more information. So I'm going to give you some, the next slide is going to be some examples of what a child might say or do. And your thing is, your um, goal is to try and reflect that back and add a little bit more. For this task, you will need a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. Look at the list below. Think about what the child has said or done and write down how you would copy and add. Please pause the video when completing this task. Hopefully you've done that and we've got some examples to feed back to you. So we've got the child says mummy car. So that would be a child at the putting the words together stage. It's a lovely stage of communication when children start doing that. So mummy car could mean all kinds of things and you really have to be there at that play and talk together stage to know what the experience is, to know what word to add. Because it could mean I want to go in mummy's car, I don't want to go in mummy's car. It's, it's there, it's not there. It could mean all kinds of things. So you could have had mummy, you could have things like mummy's red car, mummy's car's gone, um, I, I want mummy's car. It, you can add all kinds of things to that. So we've got me going in the ball pool. Lots of people talk about changing the me to I here. And it's a tricky one because there is a stage where actually using me is perfectly okay. And actually, if we change it and say, I'm going in the ball pool, you might end up with a child being very cross with you because they're saying, no, it's me. I'm not you going in the ball pool. Pronouns are quite tricky to change. Um, and it might be something you want, might want to discuss with a the speech therapist if it's hanging on in there as a, as a thing and you think it's a bit late and they're still using me. That would be something to discuss with a the speech therapist because there is a stage where that's perfectly okay. And you might just want to say, oh, you're, go you, you're going in the ball pool today, or you're going in the ball pool just now, or you're, you like going in the ball pool and adding something in that way. So I want to ride on that one. You could change it and say, oh, you want to ride on the, on the bike. You want to ride on the bike. Here's the bike. It's your bike now. It's your turn on the bike. So you're adding in lots of, of repetition around whatever it is that you're naming as well. So you name it instead of that one, because it's a non-specific vocabulary. And you name it and then you get lots of repetition in so that perhaps tomorrow they might remember the word. Okay, it's going round and round under there. We would again name the it and there. So maybe the train is going round and round under the table. Um, and then hopefully get some, join them in their play and re repeat the table and repeat um, the train. Because that's a child who maybe has got quite good sentence structure but the vocabulary is not there. I like playing football in the playground. We might say, I like playing football in the playground with my friends, or I love playing football in the playground um, with, with the red ball. You can add lots of things to that. That's a child who's got good language. But remember, all of these strategies are for children who are developing language normally, and we still want to keep adding, because the more we can do and the more language we can add now, the better children's language will be and the better progress they will make with their language. Just because a child's got good language doesn't mean that we don't want to keep copying and adding words and adding language to it. Um, and so we can keep doing that with, us, with this strategy. So a child pointing to a ball and squealing, this would be a child who's just before that first word stage. So we would keep our language really simple. So remember that the strategy is copy what they do or say and add a word. So we would point to the ball as well and we would say ball and we'd keep it really simple because the next step for that child would be to use a single word. So we've looked at the six words up early key messages and you've gone through some activities to look at those six key messages. You might want to now have a reflect over those six and think about which one in particular would be a good one to focus on in the next few weeks in your setting. Um, sometimes it's helpful to, if there's more than one of you looking at this, 
in your setting, it might be helpful to have that discussion with the other staff and think which one are we going to focus on in our classroom or in our nursery room as a whole. That way it's easier to kind of have that discussion across the board or maybe do little reminders to each other and maybe say, oh, you know, remember we're working on pause and wait. It can be really helpful to do that. Um, and actually have that discussion then when you're doing your planning about how we're going to focus on pause and wait or how we're going to focus on play and talk together and think about the vocabulary that we're using. So it'd be really useful to have a think about that and think about which key message we're going to focus on just now as the next goal. Please pause the video when completing this task. You have now reached the end of the Words Up Early Level 1 Adult Child Interaction Training. You can access further information on www.bumpstobairns.com or www.highlandliteracy.com.